All right. All right. So uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, good, good. Uh, so the talk will be about statistics and data mining with PDL. And just a little bit, uh, well, first of all, welcome you guys for staying or coming over for the talk. Uh, a little bit about my background. I uh, did cognitive psychology as an undergrad, as a, in grad school. I moved down to do uh, e-marketing a little bit, and now I'm working at Shutterstock on search engine. Uh, while at grad school, I turned out had to use a lot of statistics to do data analysis. And when Netflix Prize Project came along, I don't know how many of you have heard of it? A few. So a few years back, Netflix put out a challenge. If you can improve on their movie recommendation algorithm by 10%, they, you win a million dollars. And they give, a, at that point, a large data set for researchers. So it's awesome because, you know, as a researcher, I just can't get my hands on data. And um, so I played with that for a while. That I was, that's when I first known about PDL. I did the analysis in pure pearl. <laughs> yeah, back then. Would not do that now, but uh, that's when I learned about PDL. And later, when I was uh, working in the industry with a lot of data, I started using PDL and actually wrote the PDL stats module. So that's about me and a little about you guys. So how many of you here have uh, set through a stats class before? Quite a few. <laughs> thanks, th thanks for giving stats another chance. <laughs> All right, so uh, since there are some new people that just came in, I'll just go over very quickly a little bit of basics, very basic stuff uh, before we actually get into it. So um, if you are from just pure pro experience, this is how you create um, the PDL object from pure pro numbers. You just, you, ha you see that I have a array A, and I just call it PDL, give it a uh, reference, or I can just give it an array A. That creates the PDL object, and then I, I can call all the PDL function on it. <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, now, if I have a little bit slightly more complex data structure, like the array AB, which is a, um, you know, array of array refs. When I call PDL on that, it automatically creates a 2D array for me. I messed up a little bit. You can see, forgot to put the PDL in there. But <laughs> uh, when I do, I get a nice 2D uh, matrix. And if I go down a little bit, you can call info on your PDL object. It'll tell you the dimension, the, uh, some very basic information about your data object. In this case, it's a double of type double uh, with the four elements in the first dimension and two in the second dimension. All right, so that's about as much as you need to know to work with PDL stats. All right, so now I can get back to this thing here. All the documentation is online, and I recommend you go straight to the actual PDL stats homepage instead of looking at it on CPAN, because CPAN, the pod parser, treats PDL source code as documentation. It's kind of messy. John, John Ann promised me to fix it, but he hasn't. <laughs> He's got too much on his list. Um, all right, so for now, we can go to the homepage for all the stuff uh, that I'm going to go over here and much more. Now, the whole thing about statistics is about variability. Now, going back to the movie recommendation challenge, now, if all people are like what we have at the conference, it's Netflix wouldn't have to put out a challenge. It would be pretty easy. This is what we would get, right? <laughs> now, now, in reality, what we would get is something more like that, right? <laughs> So um, how do we deal with that? How do we describe it and try to understand what caused the difference? That's more about, that's what statistics or modeling is about. Now here is a little bit about, um, first of all, know your data is to describe or what we call descriptive statistics. The, 
uh, David has already shown you a histogram uh, just now. It's frequency distribution, how often something value occurred. Um, there's a little convenient little function in PDL stats. It's called plot distri. Um, you can give it a, it's optional. You can pass in a particular distribution name. Uh, you can look up which distributions that support. It'll plot out a function of your data with a fit, a fit of the Gaussian data line there. Or if you suspect your model is more of a log normal, you can pass in a log normal. It'll plot so you can, so you can visualize how well it fits. Now, um, it's a little clunky to always trying to look at your data at the level of frequency distribution, so there's a little bit of abstraction. We tend to talk about central tendency and spread. These are the two numbers that we need to know to have a good idea about what my data is like, the probability of getting a particular score in my distribution. Central tendency is simply uh, mostly we use the average or mean. It's just a for loop, it's just a for loop, right? Um, this is a plot of a Shutterstock since I do search queries. These are the number of letters in the search query words. You can see that mostly there are about four letters. That's the mode. The average is uh, 5.36. Fits with your expectation, right? And ones that's longer than 10 is pretty unusual. And another way, that's just the central tendency. Another number that's really important to describe the distribution is the variance, uh, how widespread the, my distribution is. Um, it's a variance, it's also called, referred to as sum of squared deviations. Deviation is simply how much, how different is my score from the average. So you subtract the mean from each individual score, you square it, you add them up, and divided by the number of observations that you have. That's variance. Um, I like the name sum of square deviations. It describes exactly what it is, right? All right. So I said that it's an abstraction of the frequency distribution. It gives me an idea about what the data is like. So from variance, you get standard deviation, which is just the square root of variance. Now, variance is because it's a you have that square term in there. It's not on the same level as your mean, so it's kind of hard to understand. You, so we take the square root, put it back on the same scale as your mean. Now, why, why would I care? Because standard deviation is a scalar that will map your data onto the normal distribution. Now, why? <laughs> why do I care? Normal distribution is a special distribution where we know very well the uh, probability of where the numbers occur. Normal distribution has a mean of zero and standard deviation of one. That's why you divide your uh, deviation by the standard deviation to map it onto the normal distribution. Once I map down to the normal distribution, I know exactly how likely a score is or not. If I get a score of two standard deviations away, above or below the mean, it's pretty unlikely. It goes on the tail, right, here and here. Now, in, uh, in the, David earlier just talked about blood pressure, monitoring blood pressure points. Blood glucose. Blood glu glucose, sorry. So it varies all over the place. Should I be concerned if I get a reading that's, I don't know if it seems really high? If you have that, right, I can calculate for this particular reading of the day, what's the z-score? If I get a z-score of two, you know what, maybe I should be concerned. Now, same in the industry, you might want to look at client file size. Sometimes, you know, I mean, a lot of us working in the industry uh, may have click tracking files from Omniture or something, and uh, they drop a file to maybe 90 megabytes, or 95, 96. One day I get an 88. Should I be concerned? Maybe there's some missing data. I can, one way to look at it is to, I gather up my last 30 days of file size. I just look at today. Is it two standard deviations below 
what I'm expecting below the average. Maybe I should look into. Maybe I should ask some questions. So, it's useful. So far, any questions? Uh, yes. Sorry, the question was: Was the plotting thing based on PG Plot Library? Yes. All right, so that was, you know, pretty much just describing what my data look like. Now, what we're really interested in is making inferences. That's why we call inferential statistics. And here's now, why is that complicated? Now, here's why. Hopefully, I can explain this pretty well here. Now, you have, say, some people the requires bribe them with, with chocolate to get them to, to do a task. <laughs> Imagine that these are your two samples. Well, you don't know. The, um, everybody was together. Now you take a sample, say the blue color you can see. So you just draw from them like two squares or four squares and, uh, and so on. You draw a sample. Now you draw another sample. It may or may not be from the same type of people, right? It's going to be different, even if they're all homogeneous. Even if just like all people in the audience, you ask how, how much chocolate you like, it's going to be different, right? Um, so you take the average of my first sample, 4.5, second sample, 6. Now, if I do a lot of these sampling, repeated sampling from this set of the numbers, I will, if I do it like 20 times, I will get 20 averages, right? So these averages also follow a distribution, it's a normal distribution typically. That's the sampling distribution of the mean. So what it is, the, uh, that's the distribution we're going to use to compare if the distributions are same or different. Now. Here is where we introduce the concept of standard error. It's simply the standard deviation around the means. So do you get the concept of sampling distribution? So it's, if you're repeating sampling, you get a distribution of the, of the averages. It's no longer the individual scores you're dealing with. It's the means. All right, so uh, there's a little bit of that. You can see that in you can pass in my uh, arrays, call PDL on it, and then call the SE function from PDL stats. It'll give you back the uh, the two uh, standard errors for these from these two samples. Now, the key question is about stats. Is given that even with randoms, just randomly sampling, things are going to be different. How do we know that the difference is due to just random sampling, or because the underlying population of the people from these two samples are actually different. That's a tricky question, right? <laughs> so here's how stats solve this problem. We start out with the uh, null hypothesis. So oftentimes, you know, in mathematical uh, proof, it's hard to go at it directly. So you set out the opposite and then reject it. The way with stats, same. So you set out the null hypothesis that uh, you assume that the means, the averages that you're comparing are not different or that uh, they come from the same distribution. And then you see, okay, given this assumption, what's my evidence like? If I have evidence that say, you know what, it's pretty unlikely to get this number with this assumption then I will have to reject my null hypothesis and accept the alternative, which is that, okay, these two numbers come, are different. They come from the different population. So in the case of, the, um, of our chocolate here, <laughs> so what we do, um, how do, uh, sorry, let me back a little bit. How do I get at the probability? Z, normal distribution, right? We just went over that. Now we calculate, we look at the difference between the two means. And there is a standard way of calculating the standard error based on these two samples. 
So we can simply calculate, okay, in this particular case, my difference between the two samples is 1.5. My standard error is also 1.5. So I happen to have got the uh, z-score of 1. Now, given a z-score of 1, this is a kind of a complicated-looking line here, but it's actually just one function. It's just looking up the probability. Look up against the, uh, the normal distribution probability. So that's the GSL part that PDL stats uses. The, um, so you get at the probability of 0.317. So that's a two-tailed probability, this part that you see it too, because you don't know it's going to go above or below your number, so you need the two ends. It's actually kind of likely to get a score that's that different, right? 30, about 32% of the time. So you know what? Those two groups of people are actually probably similar. I cannot reject my null hypothesis in this particular case. Now, actually, the little bit of a, um, uh, what's that, the, the, the small print, <laughs> was that we use T distribution instead of Z distribution for the probability lookup because um, the sampling distribution is affected by sample size that uh, T distribution is a better approximation uh, at, with small sample size. So that, what I just described, is basically t-test. And you have the t-test function in the PDL stats basic uh, module. We'll give you directly back the uh, t-score, which is one, and degrees of freedom, which you can look up these, with these two numbers. You can look up against the GSL uh, T distribution to calculate your probability. All right. Mm -hmm. Is it the T test? Is that PDL? Or your PDL? It's PDL stats. stats. Yeah. <coughs> All right. I'm going to skip this, and if I, we have time at the end, we can come back to this. All right. And now, after we've gone over that, that was just a uh, um, one variable that we looked at, how much chocolate takes, or glucose, right? It's just one variable. Now, what's more interesting is actually looking at relationship between multiple variables. Now, maybe, the, you know, the uh, when I talk about chocolate, maybe it's because people with Developers with beers and beer developers without beers, maybe they require a different amount of chocolate. I don't know. <laughs> um, so we want to look at Pearson correlation. That's one way of looking at the relationship between variables. The calcul calculation ca should remind you of the definition of variance. So what it is is you take the difference but for variable x, your one, one of your variables, you take the difference between the score and the mean. For each paired occurrence in the y variable, you look at how much different y is from the mean. So essentially, you're looking at the tendency. If my x tends to be, when my x is higher than the mean, my y is also higher than the mean, I get a positive number, right, when I multiply them. Now, if I, my uh, x is below the mean, my y is also below the mean, I get another positive number when I multiply them, right? So when you sum them up, you get a high covariance. Now, and then we can normalize that covariance by the standard deviation, by basically scale it back, scale it onto the negative one to one range. Now, you, if you get a large covariance and... Um, after you normalize, you get, probably get a correlation closer to one. That means these two numbers tend to go together. One is high, the other is also high. So, let me just so would Y be like beard length and X is quantity of chocolate? So then if, if sure. put long beards, you eat lots of chocolate. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So in this case, the, uh, we're talking about continuous variables here. Right, so the chocolate can vary between zero to however many squares, and beer length is a, yeah. If you just with with or without beer is a little, it's a it requires a different measure. Yeah, thanks. So um, that's correlation. It could some could uh, if it's negative one, that means that these two things always go in the opposite direction. 
zero means not much. It's pretty independent. Now, in that earlier case, I just showed you that uh, in our search queries at Shutterstock, the length of the keywords, it's kind of mildly interesting that if I look at how oftentimes people searched, typed in those terms, it's got a slightly negative correlation there, negative 0.09. People tend to use a little bit lower, um, shorter words. It's not that unusual, right? So this is the, uh, correlating the length of the keywords and how often times the, uh, the keyword was entered, used in a search in our log files. Long words are less often searched for. It's just kind of makes sense. And then the uh, slightly positive correlation with our how often that leads to a download on our website. Not really sure. I haven't really looked into that data. My guess would be longer words are more distinct and uh, pull up more what you were looking for. That would be my guess. And uh, here's something really highly correlated is like, uh, say, you, you can download something if you like, or you can put it in the light box, basically save it. And these two numbers are really highly correlated. Also makes sense, right? They're essentially showing that you like that, what you found. So that's correlation, Pearson correlation. Another way to understand Pearson correlation is that it's actually simply the slope if you do a, if you do a regression. If you have one variable as, your, as the uh, dependent variable and you regress it, you draw a uh, line, predict it using the other variable, correlation, Pearson correlation is the slope of how strongly these two things are related. Now that leads me to this, the uh, linear regression and sum of squares. It's a little bit busy slide, but it's actually really simple. Um, people probably here have used it already that uh, linear model is just that you have a y dependent variable you're trying to predict, and you have an intercept, and which is a0 plus with a number of uh, independent variables, axis. The, you estimate the parameter values from past um, observations, and then when you have a new number come in, you know the axis, right? You already estimated where the a's are, so you can calculate the predicted scores for y. And the um, rooming square error is what we use to measure how good a fit you have. What rooming square error is, people don't typically think of it this way, but it actually simply is standard deviation around the predicted score. Now, given that it's a standard deviation, we know z-scores, right? So z-score, we know the probability. What it really means is that given that I know here's a predicted score, here's my RMSE, um, I know that 68% of the time the observed actual score is likely going to fall within this range, right? Once the deviation above or below my predicted score. But what, what does that mean in the uh, real case? In the uh, Netflix challenge, so they started out, the Cinematch has a uh, Rumi square error about 0.95. And the average movie rating, I think it was around four, something like that. So what that means is that you, for any movie, you give a prediction and about six, say I predict to be, uh, I, you're gonna give it a rating of four. Now, 68% of the time that rating the actual rating is going to fall between 3.05 to 4.95. That's what it means. It's not really impressive, right? <laughs> it's a pretty wide range. And Netflix Challenge says that I'll give you a million dollars if you can improve it by 10%. 10% brings it down to about 0.85. Now, 68% of the time, if they predict that you're gonna get a score of four, your score is gonna fall between 3.15 to 4.85, still a pretty wide range. And guess what? It took a group of people at Bell Labs over, well over two years to get there. 
prediction is hard business. <laughs> so, all right. And uh, so PDL stats has a uh, the OLS function that does the linear regression and gives you back a bunch of statistics about how well the fit is and which variables are important or not. And there is a uh, threaded version, uh, which means that it'll, if you give it, typically uh, linear regression is done on a 2D matrix, right? You have or X and Y. Now, if you have more than one data set like that, you have give it extra dimensions, the threaded version will just automatically iterate over the extra data dimension. So that's the power of PDL. Very cool stuff. But that's the code that you uh, need to do a linear regression in PDL stats. You just give it the Y, which I showed you earlier, how to create the 2D data matrix from array refs. So it's pretty, pretty easy. Now here's looking back at sum of squares. I'm actually doing way better than I thought on time, so if you guys have questions, <laughs> feel free. Um, this is looking back at sum of square deviation. It's, that's, this is the interesting stuff, because now that's the original um, definition, right? So you have the line across the center that that's the average across all these data points. Now, what sum of square deviation is, is simply you look at the distance of your data points to this line and uh, add it up. You take the square of them, add them up. And that actually, right, that's the definition of variance. All that's different is variance is normalized by sample size. So variance is simply these things. It's just a way to visualize it. And you take the square root, gives you standard deviation. Now, take that beyond just the means. Now, getting back to what I said, that uh, RMSE is simply standard deviation around predictive scores. Now, this is the situation. When you have some x variable that you can fit with your data, that's the line that the slope is a predicted y scores. Now you calculate the uh, errors, right? Instead of to the mean, compared to the mean, you compare it against your predicted scores. Now you can cal calculate again the sum of squares, All right? So same formula like, as here. I just call it Y because it's a predicted score. Now this is the error. This is what's left over, the kind of variance that hasn't been accounted for. So you start it out with this much error, right? Look at the long lines, you add it up. Over here, you get shorter errors. Now the difference, the total minus the leftover error is how much your model have accounted for, right? So that shows, that gives you an idea of how much your model have explained the variability in your data. So the R square is a percentage. So I can say that given that I know people's beer length, I explain the way, uh, I don't know, 20% of the variance in my data. That'd be really significant. But <laughs> uh, that's the idea. Now, when you're trying to, when you do modeling, this sum of squares error, this thing difference from the actual data to the predicted score is what you try to minimize. And with typical linear regression, you um, have more data observations than you have the number of variables, so you can get actually solve it. You get a direct estimate, actual number of, unique number of where the parameters are. Now, often sometimes in the industry, you don't have that. You have, may have more observations than you have the, you have more variables than you have observations. Requires a little different math. You can do like stochastic gradient descent to figure out, kind of tweak, basically tweak the parameters around and see where you get a minimum error. There are different ways of trying to figure it out. So 
it's that, but they're, the principle is the same. You're trying to minimize the error there. Now, going on even a little crazier, you can go over k-means cluster. Um, here's kind of a uh, slightly more complicated situation, but still very principally the same. So I have some data points. I plotted it in 2D, right, x and y. Um, I you start out with a total uh, sum of squares. You calculate the distance from your data point to the centroid. The centroid is simply defined by taking the average of all your data points on each dimension and place it. That's your centroid. So you look at how far away your data is from the center. Now, what k-means does is bring you from this situation to this situation. Instead of thinking you're taking the, dis uh, the distance to the centroid of everything, you have a subgroups. So you look at your distance from your data point to the um, centroid of your subgroup. Now, you look at the error lines over here versus the error lines over here, it's much shorter. And the error lines here, when you think about it, it's exactly the definition of Euclidean distance. So sum of squares, right? There are sum of squares, but there are additions. So if you look at it, not cross this way, you look at it here, paired data points, right? That's Euclidean distance, the definition. So that's the typical k-means is trying to minimize the Euclidean distance from your data point to the centroid. Right. Same deal, you, you have the start out with the sum of square total, right? calculate it, treating it as if they're in one. And then you, st you have something like that. And uh, that's the leftover after you put people into a cluster. Sorry. Yes, it has k-means. Well, otherwise I wouldn't be talking about it. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, you have the error. Given this, you can calculate the uh, r-square, right? So that tells you the way that I cluster these, the way I put them into groups, whether they make sense, how much variance it accounted for by putting them in these two clusters. Now imagine that's normalize the weight and height of the persons. Maybe my, I cluster them by gender. I may get something like that, you know. So um, that's k-means. And uh, I think that's all the slides that I have. And I have a little demo. Um, so, sorry, I haven't described how actually to do the k-means. That's the idea. but. It's an iterative process. So you start out by assigning data points to just uh, the treated classic way of doing it. You start out with randomly assign observations to a cluster. And then you look at, you calculate the centroid. Then you compare each observation to the, to the however many number of centroid you have defined. You assign your observation to the closest one. And then after you go through this round, you repeat it. You calculate the, recalculate the centroid, and then look at each individual observation, which uh, centroid it's closest to. So we iterate through, and let's see how that works in action. All right. Can you see? Dots are rather faint over there, but all right. Can you see it all? So um, these are some random data points, and there are colors. They're color coded. They're, uh, I specify. Okay, I want four clusters out of these data. So one thing about k-means is that you have to specify how many clusters you want to start with. Um, there are ways to determine what's the optimal number of clusters, like I use it in conjunction with principal component analysis, which is another way of doing uh, cluster analysis. It's also in PDL stats, so 
Um, yeah. So here I'm um, pretty specified that I want four clusters. So you can see kind of in the center there are four colored points. Those are the centroids for my four random clusters because they're a random sample, right? You would imagine that uh, the centroid will be pretty much on top of each other. Now let's start out the k-means action. Can you see? Immediately separated. And the centroids are moving as the different data points are assigned to uh, with each iteration. Uh, sorry. Yeah, it's just random data. So, sorry. Yeah. So the question is, they um, because these are random clusters, random data. Every time I run it, it'll probably give me back random clusters. But if I ha actually the data has structure in them, uh, most likely over repeated runs, it'll converge on the same cluster. Uh, yes. So for <laughs> if your data actually have that kind of a structure, it it's quite likely that it'll settle on the structure that makes sense, but not guaranteed, not guaranteed. Uh, that's another thing about k-means is that it might have settled into a uh, local minima. Now, there are ways to help guide that process, and personally, I like to use principal component analysis, again, because I can start out, have an idea of the actual, the, the main, uh, position of the centroids to get an idea. Instead of just giving a random centroid, random cluster, I start out with something, rough idea. And let k-means to figure out where exactly to put the, uh, through the whole data set. So, yeah, so this, you can rotate it and see, kind of that uh, it separated out the, all the red dots are in one corner. They, it, put it into four different regions in that space. And this is uh, rendered with the uh, PDL 2ID. So, and, hmm? Which is standard. Which is standard. It came with PDL, yeah. All right, so that's it. <laughs> All right, questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is how does this compare to R and MATLAB, you know, other things. Um, so I started out with the PDL stats package because I could not get a native connection between PDL and R. Uh, and also, I find it pretty hard to work with the R data frame. You, it's, you really have to work at it to actually get to the numbers, right? It's layers and layers. Um, that's the main reason I started this package. And PDL turns out, I realize it's really cool. There are things you just cannot do in R. Like the, the k-means here is th threaded, which I don't... <laughs> It's really crazy. I mean, I personally haven't really needed to use it that way, but it's got a capability in there, meaning that typically K means you're working on a 2D data matrix, right? You have your variables and your observations. Now, if you have more than 2D, the K means procedure will automatically perform the K means on the other extra dimension. So iterate through. So if, say, a more concrete example is that if I have looking at movie recommendations for this number of movies and uh, this number of users in two different countries, I want two different k-means. If my data actually um, k-means support bad value, so um, I can actually stuff them into one data structure, a 3D data structure, 
and run the k-means procedure, you know, run the analysis on it. You can't do that in R, now that I know of. Same with the uh, linear regression that I just showed you. And MATLAB, I don't think it has a uh, native stats package. Is it? I'm less familiar with that. It's, hmm? it's got toolbox, yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So I personally, I like having uh, native access to data analysis in Perl because I use a lot of text analysis. If I'm doing clustering text, I'm dealing with text data. I want Perl to do that, but I don't want to ship it over to something else and then run the numbers on it. Any other questions? Yep. Um, so, what, what are you, sorry, the question is, is there support for supervised learning? Uh, what are you referring to as su support vector machines? Yeah, no, not that I know of here. Yeah, not not in this package. But you can't use k-means in a kind of supervised way, meaning that you can give it define the centroid and the. Yeah. Does PML stats have maximum likelihood estimators for different distributions? Question is, does PDL stats have maximum likelihood estimator for different distributions? I think he's. I told him to feed this question, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, there's PDL stats district that actually does the estimate for different distributions, and that's where that plot distribution, the, the function is, yeah. it uses. So, yes. So, yeah, so the question is how did Netflix set up the challenge? How, do, how can they evaluate somebody, how somebody did? Now, the evaluation, remember that RMSE, that's the, the metric that they used. And the way to calculate RMSE is to compare predicted score against observed score, right? So what they did, they have all the data. They just withheld a set of data. Given this user, they give you only a subset of the data. You predict what the score is. You don't know the actual answer. You develop it against all the training data. They have the qualifying set where you have to make predictions. Given this his, uh, historical data, now predict what this other movie that the person will rate. They have it. They just check against the prediction, the observed scores. No, no. This, the, yeah, for the qualifying, they, they have to, you know, withheld some data, and then you check against it. Uh, is, there, is there a time aspect to that? Uh, the question is, is there a time aspect to the... Um, to the... To the Netflix data? Um, I think so. I think so. Yeah. But it, it's not, it's in sequence. You don't have the exact, I don't think you have the exact timer. I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, sorry. But uh, even if they did release that data, it wasn't in their original algorithm. I don't think they said that they didn't really use that. Yeah. So. Where can I use help in PDL stats? <laughs> um, would be really nice to see other people step up and build out functions. Like if there's a test somebody needs, somebody wants, you know, just build it. Or 
let me know. Maybe I have time to add it. Um, the that's how our grow, right? The it's the community that builds it. And right now, PDL stats. I'm the only person that's actually building the functions, um, and my use case is limited. And that's why a lot of functions are actually not there and probably should be there. Now, if people like it, PDL make it pretty easy to uh, add native PDL functions to it. Like, I really, I know a very limited amount of C, but I was able to write these functions that can actually thread using the native PB, PDL support. So I'm sure you guys are probably better than me. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, I don't have, is this, the question is, is this on GitHub? Uh, this package is not. No, the PDL stats is not on GitHub. Uh, it's on SourceForge. Yeah. Um, I don't, it's on SourceForge because originally PDL is on SourceForge, so whenever PDL is moving over, I probably will too, or I, no, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, it's on SourceForge, so if you want to play with it. PDL is still on SourceForge, but we did create a GitHub mirror that David keeps up to date more or less. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. We, we've been talking about automating that, so it would be automatically in the state, but we've been trying to talk to the PDL community and go to GitHub because most of us here, many of us here like GitHub, but, um, you know, inertia, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I can really use some help to move away from Fortran. <laughs> I very much would enjoy that. Have you implemented anything specific to tax mining? Question is, have I implemented anything specific to text mining? Answer is yes, and I mean to put it out as an open source, as a module, but I haven't got around to make it how I like it. Because right now it works in memory on a limited, so works in memory means that you can only process a relatively small amount of data. I very much would like to change that before I put it on CPAN, but currently, if you want to play with it, I have the module. So you write you? Yeah, just write me. What does that do specifically? Uh, it'll go through uh, text, plain text, and uh, put them into clusters. Oh. Yeah. Do you know how that compares to Rookhouse? No. All right. All right. Thank you.